Looking into Isaiah chapter 23 this morning, I learned a new word this week, thalassocracy. In conjunction with the study, I learned uh, thalassocracy taken from two different Greek words, thalassa, which means sea, and kretien, which means power. Kretien is the root for ocracy. Ocracy doesn't mean government, it means power. So democracy is the first part people, the second part power. So democracy is power, the people have the power. So, thalassocracy forms the Greek word thalassocratia, and it means sea power. A thalassocracy then is a state, a city-state or a nation-state, which primarily has maritime realms. In other words, an empire at sea or an empire of the sea, such as the Phoenician network of merchant cities. And interestingly enough, the Phoenicians are who are the focus of our study today. Chapter 23, a prophecy against Tyre. Tyre is an intriguing puzzle. The, the two principal cities of the Phoenicians were Tyre and Sidon, and you often see them spoken of together. They're both mentioned in this prophecy here in chapter 23. The territory of the Phoenicians ran along the Mediterranean coast and Tyre was at the southern end of it, Sidon was at the northern end of it. And these were both Canaanite cities. And what's interesting is that they're in that section of Canaan that was eventually assigned to the tribe of Asher. And evidently, as you recall, when Joshua was turning over the leadership of the children of Israel to the next generation, he gave them the charge of finishing the conquest of Canaan, which they didn't do. And I'm thinking that's probably why the Phoenicians survived as a people inside the tribal land of Asher, is that Asher failed in removing the Canaanites from their territory. What makes Tyre an interesting puzzle is as we've looked at these oracles over these past uh, previous 10 chapters coming into the completion of this section, we've seen prophecies or oracles against Babylon, against Assyria, against Cush, against the Egyptians. And these were all enemies of Israel, both northern and southern kingdom. This was not the case with Tyre. The Phoenicians actually, throughout most of their history, had very friendly relation with the children of Israel. Hiram, the king of Tyre, helped finance the building of the first temple. He sent building materials, the cedars of Lebanon, sent to Jerusalem, sent materials to both David and Solomon to help in the construction of that first temple. I also believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I also believe he just voluntarily sent tribute to Solomon. Just said, Solomon, you're such a wise person, here's a few million whatevers. Which begs the question, why is God bringing judgment against the Phoenicians, specifically Tyre, but also Sidon? Now, Tyre has been attacked over its history uh, by several different of the surrounding nations. It's been attacked by the Assyrians, by the Egyptians, the Cushites, the, the Babylonians. What's interesting is that Tyre didn't actually fall until the time of Alexander the Great. Part of the reason for this is the fact that Tyre was a two part city. The main city was located on an island about a thousand yards off the coast of the mainland. The area along the coast was called Ushu, which later was referred to as Old Tyre. And this is the part of the city that had always been attacked and was eventually destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But they never were able to get out to the island until Alexander. And the reason Alexander succeeded in finally conquering the island city of Tyre is that they insulted him and he got upset. Like the, the, the spoiled child he probably was, he decided that he was going to take the island city of Tyre. And so what he did is he built what was called a mole, which is a type of causeway. Most causeways, the water flows under a mole is kind of like a breakwater. And he built this thousand yard mole out to the city on the island that was big enough to that he could wheel his siege engines out to it and eventually took the city. The other part of this puzzle that is Tyre is that 
In Isaiah's prophecy, back in chapter 14, we see him describe what I believe to be the fall of Satan, the fall of Lucifer. Actually refers to Lucifer, uses that name, Morning Star. Describes him falling from heaven. And of course, Jesus said that he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. But Isaiah refers to Satan in his prophecy as the king of Babylon. Now, in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel gives a very good description of the fall of Satan. But Ezekiel calls Satan the king of Tyre. The question is, Satan is a finite being. You know, if you come up to me and say, you know, Satan's really been putting me through the ringer this last week, I'm going to say, well, I'm glad to hear that. Because if Satan's giving you trouble, he's not giving me trouble. He can't be in two places at once. He's not like God. He is not omnipresent. So how can Satan be both the king of Tyre and the king of Babylon, which are separated by a considerable distance? And I'm sure he'd get tired of flying back and forth between the two cities. Well, I think what happened is that Tyre had built itself up as the economic powerhouse of the Near East in ancient times. They had built a vast merchant empire. There's some thinking that the merchant ships from Tyre traveled all the way up into the British Isles. And one of the things that is cited by scholars to support this idea is the fact that Tyre became a powerful tin merchant. You could buy tin from Tyre. And there are no easy sources of tin in the Middle East or the Near East. So they believed that they were mining tin in the Cornwall area of the British Isles. And so they were not a land power, but a sea power because of this merchant empire they had built. It spanned all the way from the east end of the Mediterranean Sea, out past the Strait of Gibraltar, and even up the coast, possibly even to England. I think what happened, because in Ezekiel's prophecy, starting in the 26th chapter of his book, he prophesies an attack on Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar lay siege to Tyre for 13 years. And after 13 years, manages to destroy Ushu, or old Tyre. Never is able to get out to the island itself. He didn't have landing craft. And I think what happened to explain this difference between how Isaiah calls Satan the king of Babylon and Ezekiel calls Satan the king of Tyre is that Satan was seeing Tyre diminishing as a power and Babylon rising as a power. And so, what do they say, hitched his star, or hitched his wagon to a different star, moved to Babylon at that point. And I wouldn't be surprised because in, in the 10th chapter of Daniel, Daniel describes an incident where an angel had been dispatched by God to give him an interpretation of a prophecy. And the angel says that he was delayed for what, 21 days, I believe, because he was intercepted by the prince of Persia. And that it wasn't until Michael was dispatched to battle the prince of Persia that this angel who was sent to Daniel could get and deliver the message. I wouldn't be surprised that when Persia conquered Babylon, we see that the Prince of Persia is actually Satan transferring himself to a new leader. When Paul talks about powers and principalities in the book of Ephesians, he's giving us a picture of these evil spirits, these demons that are latching themselves on to powerful governments attempting to influence them, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Because I think we see in Nebuchadnezzar if Satan was in fact the king of Babylon while Nebuchadnezzar was on the throne there, we see Nebuchadnezzar eventually being humbled and I believe repenting and coming to a saving knowledge of God by the end of his life. But that's another sermon. So why is God judging Tyre? Is it this satanic influence 
that I believe has transferred, eventually transfers to Babylon. Tyre never threatened, physically threatened Israel, either the northern kingdom after the kingdom divided or the southern kingdom of Judah. I think this judgment against Tyre and the Phoenician is based on the agency of two women, Jezebel and Athali. Jezebel was married to King Ahab of Israel, the northern kingdom. She was the daughter of Ithobael, who was the king of Tyre. Athaliah was married to Jehoram, king of Judah. She was the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab, granddaughter of Ithobael. Jezebel introduced Baal worship into the northern kingdom. Athaliah introduced Baal worship into Judah. And I think it's this introduction of Baal worship because this presented a clear and persistent danger to the children of Israel that lasted from the time of Jezebel and Athaliah through to the respective exiles of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And we see vestiges of the cults of Baal persisting even into the time of Christ. The Phoenicians may not have been a physical threat, but they were clearly a spiritual threat. And I think that's the reason we see this judgment against the Phoenicians, specifically against the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Verse 1, chapter 23. A prophecy against Tyre. Wail, you ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed and left without a house or harbor. From the land of Cyprus, word has come to them. Be silent, you people of the island, you merchants of Sidon, whom the seafarers have enriched. And I mentioned this earlier. They were a powerful, very wealthy maritime trading culture. And I believe the prophecy here in chapter 23 is dealing with that 13-year siege by Nebuchadnezzar prophesied by Ezekiel. And I'll get to why that is as we get to the end of the study here. Nebuchadnezzar raised Ushu, or the old city, old Tyre. And it's thought that Alexander used the rubble of Ushu, or old Tyre, to build that mole to go out to the city. Cyprus was one of the merchant, or one of the trading colonies, one of the merchants, merchant cities, or merchant city on the island of Cyprus, that Tyre had established, as was Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is an interesting puzzle in and of itself. It is thought by many scholars that Tarshish is the ancient Spanish city of Tartessus, which is actually located near Sevilla, which is on the Atlantic side of Gibraltar. So we know that if that is the case, we know then that the ships would sail at least that far outside of the Mediterranean. It's also thought that the reference to ships of Tarshish is either talking about ships that were capable of making the journey from the Eastern Mediterranean all the way out into the Atlantic, or that the ships may actually have been built in Tarshish or Tartessus with that capability in mind. Uh, verse three, on the great waters came the grain of Sihor, the harvest of the Nile was the revenue of Tyre, and she became the marketplace of the nations. Sihor is probably a branch of the Nile in Egypt and represents another trading partner with the merchants of Tyre. Verse four, be ashamed Sidon and you fortress of the sea for the sea has spoken. I have neither been in labor nor given birth. I have neither reared sons nor brought up daughters. Sidon was a coastal city like the old city opposite the island of Tyre. And Sidon is told to be ashamed because of the fall of Tyre, the loss of the seaport 
at Ushu or Old Tyre. And of course it says, Be ashamed, Sidon, and you fortress of the sea. That's a reference to the city on the island itself. And it's thought that there were actually two main harbors on the island city on either side of it so that the merchant vessels that would come in loaded with goods would offload there. And it, it occurs to me that probably what happened is they would then send goods into the old city, old Tyre, where the merchant trade was held. And then they would bring back and then ship out from the, the island city back out to their colonies and their other trading partners. The statement from the sea, I have neither been in labor nor given birth, I have neither reared sons nor brought up daughters. It seems that this is probably a reference to the fact that Tyre has built, or the Phoenicians have built this phenomenal trading network with very little effort. They haven't put, I guess what, the blood, sweat and tears that other nations would have because they've taken full advantage of the sea to do this. Then verse 5, when word comes to Egypt, they will be in anguish at the report from Tyre. Of course, Egypt will be in anguish because they're losing one of their major trading partners. Verse 6, cross over to Tarshish, wail you people of the island. And this seems to indicate there are some residents of the island that are looking at this time of siege by Nebuchadnezzar. They're looking to flee from the island as far away as Tarshish on the western end of the Mediterranean Sea. Is this your city of revelry, the old, old city, whose feet have taken her to settle in far-off lands? Again, old Tyre, I think, is the reference here. It's been attacked. It's eventually razed by Nebuchadnezzar. And like I said, the main, the main trading ports were on the island. The merchant areas, I believe, were in the old city. And of course, with the old city now in ruins, they have no place to easily sell the wares coming into the island itself. Remember, this is on that major route of the Fertile Crescent that goes up into what is now modern-day Turkey and then down the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. And, of course, from there it could go down through the Persian Gulf out into the Indian Ocean and trade even further east. Verse 8, Who planned this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns, whose merchants are princes, whose traders are renowned in the earth, the Lord Almighty planned it to bring down her pride and all her splendor and to humble all who are renowned on the earth. One of the things I found interesting as I was preparing this study, looking through the commentaries that I use, is that there was near consensus that the reason God is judging tires because of their wealth and their pride. And remember, money or wealth is not the root of all kinds of evil. It's the love of money or the love of wealth that is. I suspect in addition to the Baal worship that was brought in to Israel and Judah by Jezebel and Athaliah, part of the reason may come down to the fact that Tyre, the Phoenicians, saw their wealth as being able to protect them from their enemies. No one had ever been able to breach, actually breach the island city. And until Nebuchadnezzar, no one had ever thought to raise the old city, old Tyre. And I can't help but wonder if the reason for that was the fact Assyria and the Egyptians and even some of the attacks by the Babylonians over the years, that they saw their prosperity tied to this old city where all of these merchant and trading activities were taking place because they were bringing their goods in and selling them, bringing goods out. So to destroy the old city might mean to destroy their own economies. I think in part what the Lord is saying in these two verses is that Tyre, not even your great riches can protect you from my judgments. Verse 10, Till your land as they do along the Nile, daughter Tarshish, for you no longer have a harbor. Fairly self-explanatory. Daughter Tarshish, this was a colony of Tyre, so it was one of her colonial children, if you will. And they no longer have this harbor 
for their goods because Nebuchadnezzar has raised the old city. And so God is telling the people of Tarshish that they need to till their land to support themselves like the farmers along the Nile till their land to raise food for themselves. Verse 11, the Lord has stretched out his hand over the sea and made its kingdoms tremble. He has given an order concerning Phoenicia that her fortresses be destroyed. The NIV translates that word Phoenicia. It's actually the Hebrew word Canaan. So I think a better translation would be, he has given an order concerning Canaan that her fortresses be destroyed. And of course, that was the order that was given to Joshua when he brought the children of Israel across the Jordan into Canaan, that Canaan was to be destroyed. So again, in part, I think some of this judgment coming against Tyre and Sidon, against the Phoenicians, is the fact that they are basically the last vestiges of what had been the Canaanite civilization. So this judgment actually including what they did bringing Baal worship into Israel and Judah, what they did in their pride, thinking that their wealth could protect them against God, and then combine that with the order given at the time of Joshua to root out all the Canaanites from the Promised Land. Verse 12, he, God, he said, No more of your reveling virgin daughter Sidon, now crushed. Up, cross over to Cyprus, even there, you will find no rest. The judgment against Phoenicia extending all the way up from Tyre to Sidon. And I think what the Lord is saying here that is that you will try to escape. You'll go to Cyprus as refugees. And even there you will not find rest. And then as we come into the close of this chapter, we bring the Babylonians in. Verse 13 says, Look at the land of the Babylonians, this people that is now of no account. And remember, in Isaiah's day, Sennacherib, who we talked about laying siege to Jerusalem in chapter 22, Sennacherib had gotten tired of Babylon constantly rebelling against him. So he finally goes in and destroys the city and leaves it in utter ruin. This people is, that is now of no account. The Assyrians have made it a place for desert creatures. They raised up their siege towers. They stripped its fortress bare and turned it into a ruin. Wail, you ships of Tarshish, your fortress is destroyed. I think what the Lord is saying here is that what the Assyrians did to Babylon, and of course, ironically enough, it was... Ershahedon, Sennacherib's son, who goes back and rebuilds Babylon, which gives Nabopolassar a base of operation so that he's able to overthrow the Assyrian kings. Ershahedon basically sows the seeds of Assyria's destruction by rebuilding Babylon. But wail you ships of Tarshish, for your fortress is destroyed. I think what God is saying here is Tyre. The Babylonians are eventually going to do to you what the Assyrians just did to Babylon, which is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did when he laid siege to the old city and left it in ruins. And then verse 15, at that time, and again, at that time can refer to a present event, a near-term event, or a long-term event. And I think this is kind of in that middle area. I don't see this as eschatological or apocalyptic, but I also don't see this as contemporary to Isaiah's time. I think at that time, and you'll see this, I think, refers to that raising of the old city by Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the span of a king's life. But at the end of these 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the prostitute. Take up a harp, walk through the city, you forgotten prostitute, play the harp well, 
sing many a song so that you will be remembered. This passage makes reference to this 70 year. And I think this 70 years is paralleling the 70 years of the captivity of the southern kingdom. Tyre is compared here to a prostitute who has been forgotten, trying to bring the memory of her back to her former lovers. She's walking through the city, playing the harp, singing this song, trying to entice her former lovers back to her. And I think that's what God is saying here, that Tyre, after this 70-year period, will begin to rebuild and begin to recover what it had been in terms of being a trading powerhouse. But then, verse 17, at the end of 70 years, the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her lucrative prostitution and will ply her trade with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Yet, her profit and her earnings will be set apart for the Lord. They will not be stored up or hoarded. Her profits will go to those who live before the Lord for abundant food and fine clothes. Tyre will again prosper after this drought of 70 years. But what's interesting is that God through Isaiah says the people of Tyre will not grow wealthy because of this new prosperity coming to Tyre. That is going to be set apart for the Lord and sent to those who live before the Lord. In other words, it will be sent to the children of Israel. Well, what happens after the 70 years of exile in Babylon? The children of Israel are released to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and to build the second temple. Just as Tyre helped finance the building of the first temple, God is going to use Tyre to help finance the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the second temple. Very nice, complete circle when you think about it. Any question? Next week, we're going to move into the next section of Isaiah then. This is uh, four chapters, 24 through 27. These four chapters comprise what is referred to as Isaiah's Apocalypse. Thank you.